Good morning or good day, wherever you are. Today, we're going to take a look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20, what's called the Great Commission. This is a passage I've studied for a long time. And I think it's eminently important for the church. I hope you enjoy this study and learn something out of it. If you do, give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to the channel so YouTube will let you know when I put a new video up. Into the text. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version today, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Now, when the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you're interested, I have a whole chapter in my book, Reading the Bible with the Giants, that looks at how this passage has been interpreted down through the ages in the church. Really interesting read. You'd think we'd all read it the same, but we don't. So if that scratches your fancy, take a look at this, and I'll have a link to the book at the very bottom in the description underneath this video. Anyways, I digress. Back to our passage. Now, one of the themes, if not the major theme in Matthew's Gospel, is that Jesus is the King promised in the Old Testament who will inaugurate the Kingdom of God. And with the skill of a mystery novel author, he builds the suspense all the way through his Gospel to the anticipated climax when the King will establish his Kingdom. But then, right before the very end, something totally impossible happens. This king is crucified. After three years of stomping around the Galilean countryside with Jesus, having their messianic hopes raised, only to have them dashed with his crucifixion, the disciples have been reunited in Matthew 28 with the resurrected rabbi. They have been through a real roller coaster of a ride over the past few months, and now Jesus has gathered them all together on a hilltop in Galilee for his final words to them. But wait, if this is the inauguration of God's kingdom, how come not everyone else is raised? Why was only Jesus raised from the dead? Because in his death and resurrection, the first rays of this new day has dawned, but the full brilliance of that noonday sun has yet to shine. So what is God up to establishing his kingdom here on earth? This kingdom has dawned with Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection, but it is yet to be consummated until a future date. These events also declare that Jesus is the king of this kingdom, or God himself. Take a look in 28.17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I love that line. This idea of doubt brings across the idea of being uncertain, to have second thoughts about something, and it shows the very human nature of Jesus' followers. Matthew doesn't tell us what they were uncertain about. Jesus' resurrection, what's going on, his relationship to them, what was he going to ask them to do? As readers, we are left with the job of filling in the blanks for ourselves, but it shows their humanness that at this very major turning point in their lives, they had questions. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about the Gospels and most biblical books as well is how they leave the ending open-ended. Does Jesus go up into heaven here? He's just on the mountaintop with his disciples. What takes place after he gives them this commission? Do they actually go out and do it? Does Jesus appear to them any further? We don't know. We're left with him giving the commission to them, and now what? That's where our role comes in. How do you see this being played out? Do they just sit around and go, ah, sorry, this isn't for me, or do they actually go out and do it? Now, fortunately, we have the book of Acts, and we know it's going to take them a while, but they're actually going to come around and actually implement and fulfill this commission. But by leaving it open in it, it forces us to ask, 
What is our relationship to this command? Are we going to follow it? Does this apply to us as well or not? Verse 18. So here we are, Jesus and the disciples on this mountaintop. And Jesus comes up to them and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now I'm going to do another video on this whole idea of heaven and earth and mountaintops and how they play a central role in Matthew's gospel and how all of this figures into what Matthew is trying to teach us. But I'll leave it to that video. You're going to have to stay tuned for that. But one of the major themes in Matthew's gospel is that Jesus is the king promised in the Old Testament who's going to inaugurate God's kingdom. Matthew's Gospel presents Jesus as this long-expected king. Chapter 1 opens with a 17-verse-long genealogy that shows Jesus' genealogy, or inheritance, as part of the lineage of King David. In Chapter 2, we have the visit from the Magi, who have seen Jesus' star in the heavens. And in his prayer that he teaches his disciples to pray, we are taught, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And then in chapter 17, we have the transfiguration. Jesus goes up onto the mountaintop and he shines like the sun and is transfigured. While down below, he's going to heal a boy that the English translations botch with the translation of he is epileptic or he has seizure. In the Greek, it says that he is struck by the moon. Now, once again, on a mountaintop, Jesus meets his disciples. And Matthew ties these themes together here. Jesus is not just the Savior or the Messiah for mankind. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. Maybe now we can appreciate why some of the disciples were questioning. His authority over the earth includes all that there is, that has ever been, that ever is, and ever will be, including you and me. And the two phrases, heaven and earth, show that he has total universal dominion. I'm going to edit myself into the video right now because that's what I'm doing. I'm editing the video. As I was editing, I realized that many scholars feel that Matthew has stylized this section of the text according to an ancient Near Eastern enthronement pattern. In the ancient Near East, when a king or ruler was enthroned, they would give a speech, and these followed sort of a set pattern, a lot like when a new president is sworn in in the United States. Now these enthronement speeches generally followed a three-part pattern. The first part was the assumption of power. This is when the ruler would state that they have assumed the position of being the ruler of the people. I, Caesar, have ascended to the throne, or for example, as Pharaoh, the gods have chosen me to lead the land of Egypt. The second part of the enthronement speech is where this new ruler would state their expectations or how they see their kingdom and rule being characterized. For example, they would state, I know that you will follow the rules and laws of the land and are dutiful in paying your taxes and tributes to the kingdom. And the third part of the speech is where they would state their promise as ruler to the people or to their kingdom. I will establish peace on the boundaries of the empire. I will rule the land justly. I will reduce taxes, so on and so on. Now, Matthew follows sort of this three-part pattern in the closing of his gospel. For example, part one, the assumption of power. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Part two, the characteristics of his kingdom. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And number three, the promise. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Okay, I think I'm done here. Time to get back to our regularly scheduled program. Verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go. Nike is famous for its motto, just do it. But if Jesus had a motto for the church, I think it would be go and do it. If we etch this deeply in our psyche, I think it would solve a lot of problems. Instead of feeling hamstrung by the rapidly changing economic, technological, or ethical world in which we live, we don't let these external conditions rope you in. Go, move forward, outward, upward. Instead of talking about the threat that we face as a church, we should jump in and see these as opportunities. 
Go, therefore, transforms the way we look at the world in which we live from threats to opportunities. But remember, the earlier church was hemmed in and almost hamstrung by threats much greater than we face. Their Messiah had just been crucified. They're going to go out into a community that in which they were raised, the Jewish community, and face a hostile reception. Then they're going to go out into the wider Greco-Roman world where they're going to face even greater threats and possibly even death. So this command to go transforms the way we see our world as possible threats or pressures coming in upon us to one of opportunities and challenges for us to engage in. So what does this idea of go mean? Well, first off, we are to go to all the nations. Second, many argue that since this verb go in Greek is a participle, so it should be translated as going or as you go, it shouldn't be seen as a command. But that's kind of a superficial reading of the Greek text. In Greek, when you place a participle before the imperative, so go before the imperative or the command, make disciples, what happens then is that the participle takes on the force of a command. This is something that we see throughout the Old Testament, that when there are two commands in the Hebrew, let's say go and make disciples, when they translate it into Greek, they put the first command in a participle form and the second command in the imperatival form, but both of them carry the force of a command. The second thing is, is that this is a grammatical construction that Matthew loves. You can take a look at this in Matthew 2.8, 2.13. In all these instances, Matthew puts a participle, so a verb that ends with ing, in this case it would be say going, in front of the main command, make disciples. But when we translate into English, in all those instances, we usually translate them as two commands. What does this sort of digression into Greek grammar mean? It means that here, when we get go and make disciples, there are two commands. We are both to go and we are to make disciples. So when we go, what do we do? The first challenge is to make disciples. While there are hundreds of ministries that the church can and should be involved in, the core and guiding value should be that of making disciples. At its core, it means that we need to be involved in the lives of other people. Of all the nations, we are to go and make disciples of all the nations. Imagine being there on that hilltop with Jesus for a moment. There are maybe 11 of the apostles, maybe 40 other people there that might be present, that might be some of his disciples. And Jesus comes and gives us a command to make disciples of all the nations. Now you pull out your iPhone and you do some quick calculations on the hillside. Population of the world divided by the number of people here on the hilltop. And you get some pretty staggering statistics. Overwhelming, even if you're an optimist. But the amazing thing is, is that they bought into it. And you can read some of their adventures in the book of Acts. Now today, we have over 6 billion people on the earth. And the current estimate is that over half of them don't have an adequate witness or presentation of what it means to be a follower of Christ. So, are we going to go and make disciples of all the nations? In verse 19, he continues on, we are to go and make disciples, and we do this by baptizing and teaching. Now, baptism refers to the initial act of conversion, but also coming under the authority of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. It also indicates that we are to incorporate these new believers or followers into the community of disciples, teaching them all that I have commanded you. Strange as this may sound, it extends beyond having a good marriage, how to raise your kids, or how you vote. It literally means everything that Jesus has taught them, ethically, religiously, how he behaves, who he eats with, who he drinks with, everything. 
we are to take all that and pass that on to these new people who decide that they too want to follow who Jesus is. Then in verse 20, we get this interesting promise. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now Matthew opens his gospel with this thought when he tells us that one of the names for Jesus will be Emmanuel, God with us, chapter 1, verse 23. He then bookends his gospel with this thought when he speaks about who Jesus is and his relationship to his people. Lo, I am with you always. God is with us. Now this verse makes for some nice blue fluffy ideas and sermons or for these little precious type figurine statues. But I don't think this is what Matthew intended when he recorded these words. I think instead it refers to Jesus' working alongside us until the task of bringing God's kingdom into reality within this world is completed. Jesus' promise to be present is primarily to aid us in fulfilling his command to go and make disciples of all nations. We don't follow a teaching or a religion, but follow the call of the ever-present ascended Lord to go and do what he commanded us. As I said, when the Gospels conclude, they're rather open-ended. And in this case, Matthew leaves it open-ended with the question of, are you going to be involved in the Great Commission? Are you going to follow what he recorded here as the very punchline of his gospel? Well, there's a couple reasons why you should do it. First, because of what God is doing through Jesus. He is establishing his kingdom on the earth. Second, because of who Jesus is. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lord, the one to whom all power and authority has been given on heaven and earth. Third, because he actually commissioned us here in Matthew 28. And fourth, because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is always with us to lead, guide, direct, empower us so that we get this job done until his kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. And that's a phenomenal adventure to take part in. The closing words of Matthew's gospel should burn deeply in our hearts. God has not given this task to any other group of people. You're not called upon to wait for the kingdom to come, but to go into all the nations and make disciples. He has promised to be with you each and every step along the way. Well, I think I'm pretty well done here. If you're interested, you can click over here and you'll get a playlist of all my videos on Matthew. If you click over here, it'll take you to the most recent video that I posted after this one. If you click on my little face icon, that'll subscribe you to the channel and then YouTube will let you know when I post new stuff up. Until then, peace.